Okay, hello, good evening everyone and welcome to the next in our series of webinars. Uh, I'm Julia from WSET School London, um, just really here to help out this evening um, while we have a new topic, a new presenter for you. So this evening we're looking at variety in focus Garnacha slash Grenache. Um, hopefully you've been able to join some of our previous webinars, you'll know that we've been looking at lots of different grape varieties, places, different styles of wine and other drinks. Um, all of which are available and recorded on our website now, if there's any that you've missed. Uh, I'm going to pass you over to Lucy now, um, who's going to uh, tell you all about it. Great, thanks very much. Great. Um, so, uh, I'll introduce myself first. My name is Lucy Stevenson. Um, I am uh, an educator at Diversity School London. I have a kind of dual role. I'm sort of 90% marketing manager and sort of 10% educator. Um, and I kind of span when, I, when I'm teaching in the school uh, from complete beginner level tasting. So it's people's first taste of anything at the school uh, through to the, the diploma um, level, the level four, where I specialize in fortified wines and as well, um, but particularly that fortified module is what I'm teaching most of the time. Um, so uh, yeah, we were kind of, um, uh, we've been doing these, these webinars for some time now. We've done a few of the other varieties in focus. Um, some of my favorite grape varieties already been covered. Um, and I was able to kind of choose a, a great variety for this, for this session. And there's a few, reason that I, a few reasons that I chose Grenache Garnacha. Um, one of those reasons uh, for me is that it, it does link up those kind of specialisms that I, that I kind of have at the school when I'm teaching. So fortified wines, um, it's really important, particularly in French fortified wines, um, and also Spain. So we'll talk a little bit about the origins of the, of the, of the Garnacha Grenache uh, grape in, in just a moment. Um, but typically we're kind of going to be considering this to be a, a Spanish grape variety. Um, and uh, way back in a sort of previous, in a previous role at, uh, with WSET, I, I spent some time uh, writing some of the materials for our, our level two qualification, uh, which I think a few people in the, in the chat said they were just embarking upon now. Um, so uh, a lot of that is very heavily focused on the grape varieties. And uh, so during that time, I did quite a lot of research into all the different grape varieties that are covered on the level two, and I wrote quite a lot of those. Um, and it really struck me that uh, Grenache or, or Garnacha is, um, is kind of not really given the, the status that I, I think it should be. I think there's a lot of really exciting wines to, to come out of this great variety. Um, so I found myself when I was kind of going back into my old notes and doing some extra research for this webinar, um, kind of finding myself kind of making a bit of a case for why this grape needs to be uh, celebrated a little bit more than perhaps it has been um, and maybe focusing on some of the regions later on in the session on uh, who have really kind of helped with the pushing of Grenache um, as, a, as a particularly important and, and, uh, and top quality grape variety. Cool, so can everyone see my slide number two there? Can we move that along properly? Great. All right, so uh, we'll start off with some history origin synonyms. So just a little bit of a background on this grape variety. As I mentioned, typically we're going we're gonna to be calling this, this grape variety a, a Spanish grape variety, which has found itself in other parts of the world. Now, um, that is the typically held um, theory. Uh, there has been a little challenge on that from, from some Italian researchers uh, claiming to have found some very early records of it in Sardinia. Uh, it is a little bit difficult to be 100% sure, but the... Uh, the theory holds that there is there's a lot of genetic uh, diversity of the different varieties of, of Grenache or Garnacha in Spain. Uh, typically, we're going to find a lot of that. Um, it's considered to be uh, coming from the, the Aragon area, the, previously the, the Kingdom of Aragon. There. And you find all sorts of different types of, of Grenache there. So not only the Grenache Noir or Garnacha Tinta that we're going to be focusing most of the session on, but also the... Uh, the other Grenache varieties, which I'll touch on in a moment. I, I mentioned that we've got Garnacha Tinta as a synonym. Um, we've got Grenache Noir, which we call it in, in France, and in Southern Europe, it's known as Caranao. Uh, and there are a number of other synonyms around the world as well. Uh, those are just, just a few of the kind of, uh, the most commonly used ones, I suppose. Um, so in terms of the other Grenache varieties, the focus of the session will be on, uh, on the, the black version, the, uh, the sort of black grape variety Grenache. Um, but uh, there have been a few kind of mutations of this grape variety over its history. So we have um, a, a white skinned version, Garnacha Blanc, uh, uh, sorry, Garnacha Blanca or Grenache Blanc. Uh, we've got Grenache Gris slash Garnacha Roja. Um, and you also have uh, 
a hairy version of Grenache, um, the hairy leaved version, uh, which has basically so called because it has a little bit of a downy fluff on the bottom of the leaves. Um, La Donna Pelou or, or Grenache Pelouda, which is not as not as widely grown, but you find that in in, in Roussillon, you find that in the, in the, the Aragon area of, of Spain as well as a few other places too. Um, and they all they all really kind of do um, come back to that sort of that original black grape variety, they all have a lot in common with it. So the, the Grenache Blanc is very, very similar in terms of its texture and its character to its to the Grenache Noir. We'll talk about how kind of full-bodied its wines can be, how rich, um, how textured, um, and that is certainly the case for, for Grenache Blanc as well. Grenache Gris has a beautiful perfume to it, which Grenache Blanc doesn't have quite so much of, but it can when it's when it's made really well. Um, and uh, La Donna Pelou or, or Grenache Peludo is the uh, it, it's again, it's quite similar, but it has maybe just a touch more acidity and sometimes a little bit more kind of raw fruit to it as well. Um, but uh, the focus of the session will we'll focus on, on Grenache Noir or Grenache Tinta because that is that's definitely the most kind of widely grown grape variety. And it was, in fact, the, the widest grown grape variety um, uh, at one point in history. It's, it's now kind of hovering around some seventh, eighth, depending on the figures that you look at at the moment. So a lot of the the Grenache has been pulled up over the years and replaced with other grape varieties. Um, but certainly we're finding that a lot of the, um, the top quality wines from the, from the various different regions we're gonna be talking about are those where the vines survived. And some of the vines that we're talking about are gonna be really, really old vines that produce tiny quantities of really concentrated, really outstanding uh, Grenache fruit. All right, so in terms of the characteristics of Garnacha Tinta. Um, we'll talk about the vine first and then we'll talk about, about the wine, the vine and the wine. So the, the vine itself is a, it's, it's quite a late ripening grape variety, which means that it's the sort of one of the last in, in the sort of vineyards surroundings, it's one of the last of the grape varieties to, to ripen. It needs a large amount of sunshine and needs a large amount of warmth in order to get fully ripe. And it does need to achieve full ripeness before it starts to really display its, its proper characteristics. Um, it, uh, it, therefore, you're not going to find it in anywhere that's a cool or a, or a moderate climate. Typically, we're talking about warm and even hot climates, um, which does limit the, the amount of places that it can be grown, but also makes it quite a suitable grape variety for a, a we have here was a warming climate that's getting warmer um, by the year and harvests for other grape varieties are, are getting dangerously early and this one does kind of because of its late ripening nature it kind of it, it needs a bit more time to, to ripen. It's also really drought tolerant um, which means that it can withstand uh, sort of shortages in water. It doesn't need quite as much water directly available as some of the other grape varieties that might be planted alongside it. Um, and it can be quite wind tolerant as well, uh, especially when it's pruned in a certain way. And you can see that in the, in the picture that we have there, uh, which is a sort of uh, a, a bush vine that's trained quite low to the ground, um, which kind of really helps. And, and, and we're talking, we're going to talk about uh, the Southern Rhone and, and the Long de Roussillon area in Provence, uh, which uh, in varying degrees suffer from the, the strength of the, of the mistral wind, uh, which can come through and can desiccate the grapes slightly, can, can knock over some vines, can uproot some vines in, in, in the extreme cases, and these kind of hardy bush vines, uh, Grenache bush vines uh, trained uh, en gobelet or, or in bush vines um, can be quite useful in, in withstanding that wind. It can be quite a vigorous grape variety, it tends to uh, like to grow upwards quite fast um, and, and produce quite a lot of, of vegetation as well and that can be kept in check um, with uh, the, the pruning method that, that's used, um, the training methods um, but also the soils um, as well and you find Grenache being planted on some pretty yeah, pretty arid soils that don't have a huge amount going on in terms of fertility at all um, uh, because it as I say it doesn't it doesn't need um, huge amounts so it you find Grenache being grown on places where there's only really the only other kind of vegetation that can grow is sort of maybe thyme lavender things like that that again don't need lots of nutrients and lots of and lots of water um, We've got some really, really long-lived vines uh, around the world of, of Grenache, as you do with, with 
Shiraz as well, Syrah. Um, uh, but one of the reasons for that is because it is very tolerant of some of the diseases that other, that other varieties might be uh, more prone to. So esker, for example, things that might, um, that might affect the wood itself, the hard permanent wood, tends to be fairly tolerant to those in comparison to some other grape varieties, which may go some way to explaining its, its longevity um, in, the, in the ground. Now, the next slide I'm going to talk about the grape varieties characteristics, um, but I want you to take it with a little bit of a pinch of salt because I can explain, I can sort of say, you know, most wines are like this, most wines are like this, but yield, the amount of grapes that any one particular vine is producing, um, really makes a massive difference as to the, the style of, of Grenache that, that you end up making. You can make something very light and fruity and a fairly simple in flavour and not particularly textured, um, or you can make something that's much more concentrated and, and much more intense flavoured and a bit more structure to it as well if the yields are, are very low which they typically tend to be from some of these very old vines um, and particularly on porous soils as well. So that moves on to the, the wine. Um, so as a grape variety it's it's thinner skin than some of the other grape varieties that it's planted with. So it's planting neighbours tend to be other um, Rhone grape varieties, other Mediterranean grapes like Syrah, um, Mortbedra, um, Carignan, um, which tend to have much thicker skins um, and the thickness of the skins is going to lend colour and it's going to lend tannin to the final wine and uh, with, uh, with Grenache or Garnacha we've got a, a relatively thin skinned grape. Uh, again at lower yields those skins tend to seem a little bit thicker and you can get a bit more colour and tannin but on the balance of sort of high to low tannins it tends to be on the softer end. They don't tend to get particularly high apart from in a few uh, extreme cases. Um, the grapes themselves are quite, they can get quite large and they can get quite sugary as well. Um, so when you have sugary grapes at the start and you ferment that out to dryness, um, if you get all the yeast to eat all those sugars and turn them into a dry wine, you're going to end up with a pretty high alcohol wine. Um, it's, it's always been capable of producing fairly high alcohol levels, but these days it's quite common to see Grenache based wines that are 14.5, 15, 16, maybe even kind of getting up a little bit higher than that in some cases. And it can be a real problem at the moment to try and stop that alcohol getting so out of hand. Because one of the worst things uh, when you're talking about balance in a wine can be a wine just tasting really hot, burning and having that heat to it. Um, so you certainly need the intensity of the flavour, um, the structure of the wine, like the acid and the tannin as well, to try and, to try and balance that out if you are going to have a particularly high level of alcohol in the wine. And the alcohol is going to add a, a sensation of, of body as well, this kind of smoothness on the palate that can put us in mind of sugar, um, but actually, you know, even in a dry wine, you find this kind of textural body sensation in some of the Grenache based wines that we're going to be talking about. Typically quite low in acidity, uh, it doesn't tend to have huge amounts of acidity by the time it's fully ripe. Um, there are examples where they pick a little bit earlier uh, before the grape has achieved its kind of full potential ripeness that have a little bit more acidity. Some of those wines are used for making um, some of the rosé wines that we're going to talk about, um, but uh, on that scale it tends to be on the, on the lower end of acidity as well, sort of moderate at most, uh, medium at most, but usually on the lower end. Um, its primary fruit flavours tend towards red fruits, which is, when you, again, when you compare them to other grape varieties it's planted alongside, like Syrah or Verge, that's quite different. They're, they tend to be a bit more about the kind of dark black fruits, whereas um, the fruit profile for Ganache tends to be strawberries, red plum, red cherry, um, all this kind of nice fresh fruit. And it can be very, very fresh, uh, but if, this, if the grapes go particularly almost into a state of overripeness, they can get a little bit jammy as well, which jammy sometimes uses as a, as a, a negative term. Uh, when it comes to wine but sometimes there's a time and a place for a wine that just tastes like strawberry jam and it can be quite delicious in certain styles of wine. Um, in terms of the other kind of primary characteristics of the wine it is often this kind of little bit of a white pepper note to it not like that kind of really dark black pepper that you find in in Syrah something a little bit lighter than that um, in some of the, the lower yielding wines. With age it tends towards oxidation quite quickly. So this is a grape variety on its own, 
that doesn't have some of those natural um, antioxidants. It doesn't have a lot of acidity, it doesn't have a huge amount of tannin to help protect it from oxygen. So it can age fairly quickly if you don't blend it with other things or you don't protect it from oxygen during the winemaking. Um, that can be a negative thing, but it can also be a great thing if you're wanting to make something that has this lovely kind of caramel dried fruits and sometimes this kind of nuttiness that these wines can have. So you find that in some of the, uh, the oxidatively aged Vendu Naturel, um, of, of the of the southern Rhone and the Roussillon area in particular, some of those very old Roussillon uh, VDNs have this lovely caramel dried nuts character to them, which is delicious. But to a lesser extent, you can find it in old Chateauneuf de Pape, the old Priorat, you know, all sorts of things like that too. So wine making influence, I've split this up a little bit into um, red wines rosé wines and fortified wines as well because it can be quite different depending on the style of wine that you're going to make what kind of wine making techniques the producer is, is likely to use and even within the red wine spectrum it can be quite massively different depending on whether you're making a, a light fruity early drinking style or whether you're intending to make something that's really intended for aging something that needs longer uh, to evolve um, but quite commonly depending on the style of wine you're making you might once you've harvested your grapes, uh, you may crush them open and before the fermentation starts, you might let them macerate the skins with the juice. And this um, is, is often used to promote like a really vibrant fruitiness to get some extra color uh, as well um, into the wine. Because as I say, it's not a particularly thick skinned grape, so sometimes it can give a little bit of extra help on getting the color into the, into the juice. Um, during the fermentation, uh, temperatures massively vary depending on the styles of wine that are likely that are going to be produced uh, within the red wine range. Um, light and fruity can be produced, but so can something a little bit heavier and spicier at warmer and warmer temperatures. Um, and sometimes, depending on the style again, uh, you might find that a proportion of whole bunches of grapes um, uh, or berries are used in the fermentation. If this is happening, it's often to promote like a really vibrant, fresh, fruity character. Um, you, you probably know, you, you may have heard of, uh, of carbonic maceration or semi-carbonic maceration from studies of, uh, of Beaujolais, for example, but it's very common practice to use some whole bunches or, or whole berries in various different fermentations, especially if you're wanting vibrancy of fruit character. So that might happen. In terms of the winery vessels, um, typically the, the tendency is away from um, sort of brand new oak. So even when during the fermentation, we we're typically using stainless steel, concrete or large old oak vessels. Um, and it's often a fairly protective fermentation in that what they don't want is necessarily loads and loads of oxygen getting in um, during this stage or during the stages shortly after, um, because as I say, it's fairly prone to, to oxidation. So it can, um, it can lose some of its fresh fruit flavors. So usually um, it's, it's fairly protective winemaking that happens. I could go into loads more detail on the, on the winemaking, but one of the most important things to, to think about when you're making a Grenache-based wine is that it is very commonly blended, and blending is very important when it comes to Grenache-based wines. There are examples of 100% Grenache out there, and there are some outstanding examples of 100% Grenache out there, um, but it's just very common to find that it's not the only grape variety in a blend. Even, the, even a wine that says it's 100% Grenache or Garnacha, if you maybe check the tech spec, there may be a little, a little proportion of other grape varieties in there, depending on the local rules for what has to, has to happen. Um, so in terms of blending, the blending partners tend to be uh, grape varieties that can give a bit more color, a bit more tannin, a bit more acid to the wine. Because we've we potentially ended up with a wine that's pretty alcoholic, quite full bodied, um, but maybe doesn't have quite as much acidity and as much tannic structure as other wines might do. So it may be very useful to blend in Syrah, Mauverge, Carignan, um, to, which are great varieties that have thicker skins and give more tannin and more acid. And Sanso, not so much by way of the tannins, but beautiful acidity and really fresh, vibrant red fruit. The Sanso is a very common blending partner with the, the rosé wines that, that Grenache produces. Um, uh, in fact, I've got a little rosé wine just next to me right now, which has a little bit of Syrah and a little bit of Sanso in it. So I'll talk about that in a moment uh, when we come to uh, the Provence slide. Um, but yes, we've, uh, we've commonly finding uh, blends throughout all the different places where, where Grenache is grown.
So wine making fluids in terms of rosé wines. Okay, so this is what I've got in my glass right now. I've chosen a rosé wine. I could have, you know, there's a lot of different Grenache-based wines out there that I'm very passionate about. The reason I've gone for a rosé tonight uh, is because I was actually supposed to be in Provence this weekend. I was supposed to be there with my mum at the moment. Um, obviously, that's one of the one of the trips this year that hasn't hasn't gone ahead, which is a shame. But uh, bought uh, bought myself and her. A little bit of Provence rosé to, to pretend uh, to put ourselves uh, into the the mindset of being in Aix-en-Provence, um, and uh, it's not a, it's not hugely often that I drink rosé wine, but this is you know a really nice occasion to have some kind of really puts you in mind of holidays, um, but also actually can be a really food friendly wine that can be drunk all year round. It's quite nice to have a rosé, and there are various different styles of rosé that, that Grenache produces. Um, you can get a very very lightly coloured rosé if you just do what we call direct pressing. Um, so very much like when you're making a white wine, you just take the grape the, the grapes, um, you crush them and, and pretty quickly you press the skins. So you're separating the skins from the liquid, from the, the sugary liquid inside. Uh, and the act of doing that, um, when it's quite gentle, produces a quite a delicate, sort of sometimes called a blush colour of rosé with just a little hint of, of pink to it, which is in fact uh, the method of production that this particular wine here has uh, has been produced with, which is a sort of pale orange pink colour that we have in the glass there. So quite light, not the lightest I've ever seen, but, but quite light on the scale of rosés. And there are some other rosés, um, particularly some of those that are famous in the, in the Southern Rhone um, and those that were quite traditional in Navarra in, in, uh, in Spain as well, where the colour is much darker and getting a little bit closer to being more like a light, a light red wine. Um, so usually when this is happening, it's, it's maceration on the skins. So before the, the pressing happens, you've got the skin spending time in contact with the juice. And the period of time that the wine is spent, with the, the liquid is spending in contact with the skins uh, determines how dark the final colour gets. So it might be, might be a few hours, it might be pushing up against a couple of days if they want a particularly deep colour. And that may or may not extend into the fermentation period. Sometimes the fermentation might start up during that time before the pressing happens. And sometimes they, they press the liquid away from the skins before the fermentation uh, takes place. Usually, uh, I mean, there are some more traditional styles of rosé being made where, where oak is used, um, but quite often, and, and more so at the moment, uh, we've got stainless steel uh, uh, or concrete, so inert vessels being used quite a lot. Again, with rosé wines, it's, it's quite often, it's about the fruit. It's about really bright, vibrant strawberry, raspberry, cranberry fruits, that kind of thing, and keeping the, the wine away from oxygen when it's being made and where it's being stored before bottling is, is quite important to preserve those characters, as is during the fermentation, keeping the temperature not too hot. Um, so not necessarily really, really cold, um, but sort of in the mid-range usually for, for where a white wine would be fermented um, at, to promote fruity characteristics. And again, a lot of the rosé wines, they're blended. Uh, Syrah, Sanso are quite common blending partners, again, adding some acidity um, and a little bit of kind of flavour complexity that might, it might be beneficial in there as well. The Grenache blending, a little bit of texture of the body and also that vibrant fresh fruit character. Finally, on our kind of winemaking options, I want to talk about fortified wines. So I don't know how into fortified wines you are personally. Um, it's very much a passion of mine. Um, uh, it might not have been the first thing that you thought would come up in, in a, Grenache, uh, a Grenache webinar. Um, it may have been, um, but uh, it's, uh, it's certainly uh, something that Grenache has the potential to do incredibly well, is fortified wines. And I'm focusing this particular slide on Vendue Naturel, so the, the French, uh, uh, Southern French fortified wine style. But it's by no means the only fortified wines that are produced around the world from, from Grenache or Garnacha. Uh, you find wines in, in Australia, in California, in South Africa, uh, using uh, Grenache as one of the great varieties in the blend. Uh, but probably the most famous uh, part of the world that, that uses Grenache in its blend, um, or even as a single varietal wine, uh, is, is the, the Vendue Naturel of southern France. Um, so these, if you've not had the pleasure of trying them, they're, they're not as famous as port, but they are in a similar, a similar category. If you like port, try some of these. There's some amazing stuff. Um, and very, it's not hugely abundant, certainly on export markets, but it's, it's, it's not, you know, it's got beautiful price points attached to them as well. Um, recently finished a case of, uh, of banyols, which I bought in the winter time, 
and they've kept me warm through the winter for sure um, and into the spring. Um, Vendue Natural, they have sweet fortified wines. Um, so to fortify essentially is about strengthening the wine and to strengthen it you're adding alcohol. So it's a wine that has had alcohol added to it. Um, so different types of fortified wine, the fortification happens at different points. So in sherry, for example, the fortification takes place at the end of the fermentation. So once you have a dry wine, then you add alcohol to that and you end up with a dry fortified wine. Whereas with Vendue Naturel and with Port, for example, um, the fortification takes place during the fermentation. So what it does is it actually halts the fermentation because you're adding high strength spirit. Um, so you're adding sort of 95 to 96 percent and quite a neutral, pretty well, a neutral grape spirit that's added. Um, and you're basically killing the yeast by adding that spirit. Um, so you're bringing that alcohol level up above 15 percent. And at that point, the yeast can't survive anymore. So you eventually end the fermentation there, you're strengthening the wine while doing so, and you end up with a wine that is sweet and that has an elevated level of alcohol. So 15 to 18% is quite common for the Grenache based ones, which is normally something like 16 to 18, the, the 15 and more for the, the, the white Muscat, the, the Bug de Venice, for example, the, the Muscat based um, BDMs. And you have a, a, range of, a range of styles being produced, probably, probably even more different types of styles than you might find in port or a similar amount. There's uh, unaged or youthful styles, which are really all about fresh fruits. So you get blackberries, raspberries, plums, that kind of thing. You get sometimes a quite jammy character. Um, and you also have oxidatively aged wines. So wines where you've not tried to protect the wine at all from oxygen uh, during its aging. In fact, you've uh, exposed it to oxygen deliberately. So these are deliberately oxidatively aged wines. So this might happen by placing the wine in an oak barrel and letting the oxygen come in through the oak barrel um, and that can oxidize the wine. It's old oak that's used rather than new because it's not about the new French oak flavors or, or, or American oak flavors. It's about just the oxidation of the, of the wine. Um, but as you can see in this photo here, um, we've got a, um, a sort of rows of what we call bonbons. Or bonbon in, um, in in France, we've got demi johns essentially. They're big glass jars uh, which can be used by some producers to oxidatively age their wines. So not only have you got oxygen sacking these wines, you've also got uh, sunshine and you've got heat as well in the in the hot vineyards that you can see here. So the the result of oxidatively aging the wine is that you just change the entire fruit profile of the wine. It ends up being not about fresh fruits. It's much more about like dried fruits and caramel and some nuttiness and some coffee and all these what we call tertiary characteristics. Um, you sometimes hear people describing them as rancio. So this kind of really strong kind of um, character of, um, of nuttiness, even sometimes like a slight wood varnish characteristic, which isn't necessarily a nice marketing term, um, but it uh, is something that you find sometimes in these, these rancio, um, very extremely oxidated the age. Cool, so that's the kind of the base, the sort of overview of the grape variety itself, I suppose. Um, so now I just wanted to kind of touch on some of the places and only a really small proportion of the places really just due to time that have made Grenache one of their key grapes. Um, so, um, oops, I was there. So I unmuted no questions. No. Um, so we have, yeah, just a map here of around the world. Um, I wish I could go into all the different places around the world. There was a few people popping up from some of the places that I wanted to include in this uh, in this webinar, but um, haven't uh, haven't had the time in this particular one to, to focus on. Um, but we do have wonderful producers making wines from Grenache in uh, in the U.S. and California and Washington. Uh, wonderful wines um, in South Africa as well. Relatively small, you know small um, uh, in terms of plantings in South Africa. Um, lots of different places. Sardinia, as I mentioned earlier as well, where it's known as Cananal. Um, I'm going to focus um, for, for the first period of this on, on France. Um, this is just, I don't know exactly why we always do this. We always start in France and go around the world, but actually really here, we should probably be starting in Spain as that's where this great variety comes from. But bear with me, we'll talk about France first and then we will, we will get to Spain and we will then go elsewhere as well. We're gonna to go to, to Australia in particular and look what they're doing with this grape. 
So Grenache Noir in the Southern Rhone. Um, so this is um, the, the, as you're kind of going from north down to south in, uh, in France, and that is often the way that, that sort of French wine is taught. You often kind of go from, from north down to south. It, so it takes a little while for, for you to come across Grenache as, as a great variety when you're kind of doing things that way, because that actually is only in the very south um, of the country where the climate becomes warm, not just moderate, um, that we find Grenache coming into its own. And it becomes incredibly important when you get to the Southern Rhone. So not in the Northern Rhone. The more, Northern Rhone tends towards a more moderate climate, higher continentality. Um, and Syrah is the, is the black grape variety up there. Um, and then you kind of move about sort of 60 kilometers a little bit more down to the Southern Rhone. And that's where the valley flattens out a lot more. Um, and you get a lot more of the Mediterranean influence coming from the Mediterranean Ocean, which is not too far away from this, uh, this part of the world. Um, so the Mediterranean climate, warm, sunny, uh, and perfect for ripening Grenache. Um, you do have the Mistral wind, as I said, which can be, you know, really quite intense and very, I don't know if anyone's ever spent much time in this area, but the Mistral is, you kind of think you're going to, to Avignon or something like that, and it will be a beautiful, sunny, still day, but when the wind comes through, it can be very, very intense and knock over everything that's on your table, which has happened several times. Um, so those low-trained bush vines uh, can be really helpful in protecting against the, against the windy climate that we have. So it's, it's generally a little bit flatter here than we find in the Northern Rome, but the, the, the topographies are, there is a range of topographies. We do have um, the, uh, so for example, Chateauneuf de Pat, which is relatively flat, um, as opposed to when you kind of go up more towards the, the, the uh, AOCs closer uh, along the, the east, so um, Rasta, uh, Gigolda, Vaca, um, those, those areas, um, the topography is a little bit more mixed there. We're kind of getting this from higher altitude. Um, uh, vineyards there too. So here Grenache is really important across the quality spectrum. So everything from the, the most basic uh, Côte de Rome, um, and Côte de Rome, I'm, I'm a massive fan of Côte de Rome, Côte de Rome Village, they're like pretty much my go-to every time I just want like a, a relatively easy drinking wine that's not going to break the bank, it's, it's definitely a go-to, but you can also get really shocked by the quality of some of the Côte de Rome Village, and particularly ones that have a village name uh, appended to the end there. There's some really wonderful wines to be found within those quality brackets. Um, not necessarily wines that are built to age for really long periods of time. So these are wines where you might find a portion of the whole bunches or whole berries or something like that. You might find that extra vibrancy of the fruit. And, um, and you know, not too tough, not too tannic, not too acidic. Uh, not, too acidic. Um, and not wines where you need to have a really salty piece of meat or a salty stew or something like that alongside them that can be really lovely wines just to have on their own. Um, I sort of, um, I know Julia's collating some of the questions for the end, but I did spot a question about the, the lighter styles um, potentially being chilled in some cases. And, and yeah, there are there's some really nice examples, not just here, but also in Spain, where the, the, um, the, the lighter styles can definitely benefit from a little bit of chilling. Um, then you have your cru wines. So there's some of those very, very famous appellations, particularly famous is Chateauneuf de Pau, and actually has left some of the other AOCs in this area a bit in, a bit in its shadow because of how famous it is. Um, but the wine styles, uh, the wine style of Chateauneuf de Pau can also be found in a few of the other uh, appellations here to uh, enter the same quality level too. So Gigonda, Vaquera, beautiful, beautiful wines. And they're tending towards, when they're making the red wines, they're tending towards these bigger full body styles that do potentially have a bit more age potential to them. And certainly the top quality wines of all of these regions can age beautifully and they can get um, wonderful, that caramel, nutty um, and, and, and dried fruit character over time too, as well as beautiful spice. The texture of some of these wines is just really outstanding um, and uh, really delightful for that reason. We also have rosé wines being produced in, in quite a few of the different appellations are allowed to produce uh, rosé wines, some are, some are, um, but one that has a particular focus um, on it is Tavel. So Tavel, which you can see over on the, uh, on the western bank there, um, traditionally kind of known for making a, a richer, deeper style of rosé. Um, and if you're kind of trying to think of a style of rosé around the world that can age, there's not many of them, but some of the, the top quality tavels have that ability to, to age and, uh, and gather new flavours as they get older too. There has been a trend more recently, uh, probably influenced by the popularity of Provençal rosé um, towards the lighter, more delicate styles of rosé in, in, in the Southern Rome, um, but you can still find some of those, those more traditional styles too, for sure. 
And then we have the Vardu National Rail here too. So Rasto in particular um, is very famous for its, its Vardu National Rail. Just wanted to take a closer look in before we leave the Southern Road at Chateauneuf de Pas. Um, as I say, it has kind of it has kind of held the limelight of the Southern Rome for um, for for a long time now, and still is is one of those names. It's one of those wines that I think long before I even started drinking wine, I think I've known that name Chateauneuf de Pas somehow. It's kind of got in by osmosis somehow, um, and uh, and it's very distinctive on a supermarket shelf. You've got the embossed bottle that you find from quite a lot of embossed bottles. Um, and it, it's famous for a few reasons. Um, one is that kind of quite distinctive name, which translates as the, the Pope's New Castle, essentially. So which harks back to the time where the, uh, the papal court relocated to Avignon um, in the 14th century. And there was a summer residence uh, built, essentially, there, which was the, the Pope's New Castle. Um, so a bit of history with that. Um, but in terms of wine history, for sure, it holds a special place. Um, you may or may not be familiar with the Appellation d'Origine Controle system that we have in France, um, and you find it uh, echoed across a lot of uh, other European wine regions. Um, the Chateauneuf de Pape played a massive role in, uh, in sort of establishing that AOC system. So Baron de Roy um, of Chateau Portier, um, was very kind of instrumental in setting up a prototype and kind of delimiting an area and saying, okay, if it's Chateauneuf de Pape, it has to come from this area. And uh, kind of rumor has it that he, he put into place the delimited area by um, how arid the land was and how kind of poor the land was. So only where um, you found uh, lavender and thyme growing and nothing else was the right place to be to be growing the grapes for Chateauneuf de Pape. And there were also a whole load of other rules that were that were brought uh, into um, that were brought into place officially in in the 1930s. And, um, and um, the list of grape varieties that, that's permitted here is pretty extensive in comparison to some of the other grape uh, the, some of the other wine regions that we know in France. So if we go to Burgundy, we're talking single varietal wines. Um, here, 18 different varieties permitted. So 13 really, but then the, var the color variants on those. Uh, as well kind of build it up to to 18 different grape varieties that are permitted uh, in the in the wines um, so that's a lot of choice that the winemaker has um, some winemakers will take advantage of a lot of those different grape varieties and and and, uh, and use the different elements that they can bring together and some some producers just like to focus on one they like to potentially focus on on grenache as their one so Chateau Reyes, uh, Reyes for example um, is, is one that is just using uh, Grenache and it is permitted to do single varietal wines here it's not permitted in, in all parts of the Rhone or down in the south of France either in the AOC wines but it is um, so yeah, and then back in the day when they were drawing up these uh, these regulations, they put into place a stipulation that the wine had to be a minimum of 12.5% alcohol without any shuttleization or yes, any addition of sugar. That was potentially quite difficult at the time, and that was the certainly the kind of the highest minimum alcohol level in in France. Um, that, uh, and I think it might still be to this day, in fact, um, but it, it is not hard today to get a wine to 12.5%, especially if it's a Grenache-based wine. In fact, normally when you're looking at Chateauneuf de Pape, you've got a 14.5% alcohol wine as a minimum, and they can go up a bit beyond that. Um, so yeah, typically we're looking at big, full-bodied, rich wines here. So yeah, as I say, some, some producers are using single varietal here, uh, and some of them are taking more advantage of some of the other grape varieties. More verdure in particular can be a really wonderful one to add in to the blend. Um, it ages beautifully. It gets this really lovely meaty savouriness that helps the wine to age in a really nice way as well. Um, so yeah, different producers doing different things. And whenever you look at Chateauneuf de Pape, whenever you're taught about Chateauneuf de Pape, you're taught about what we can see in this picture here. You're taught about these uh, galets or, or pudding stones, as we kind of anglicise it to. Um, these big round stones, essentially. There's one in the office. I like to use it as a prop usually when I'm teaching, but I don't have one here. But you can see them in the picture. Um, they retain heat very, very well. And that's the, you know, that's the theory. The theory is that they conduct heat, too. They basically store heat. Um, that is you know, coming from the sunshine during the day. And that then uh, allows the, um, the, the vine to carry on ripening in 
into the night time as well. So you don't just have the warmth in the day, you also have the warmth in the night. Great when it was hard to get wines to 12.5%. Not necessarily so important now when it's actually a struggle to keep them under 16%. Um, so uh, it's very famous for these, for these galets and, and they are found in quite, in quite a lot of the most famous vineyards. Um, but there's actually a lot more soil diversity than that in Chatsmith. In fact, there's also limestone, clay, sandstone, sand. Um, and typically, it's thought that if the, the grapevine is grown on more sandy soils, there tends to be a little bit more lightness, a little bit more freshness uh, to the fruit there. So yeah, it's, it's a very varied Appalachian, really. It's, um, it's, it's quite big. Uh, it's got lots of different types of soils, and you can use... 13 8 slash 18 different grape varieties in the blend which naturally means that there's a lot of variety of quality as well so there are wonderful Chateauneuf de Pape some of my favorite wines have been that I've tasted have been Chateauneuf de Pape but there are also some wines which just have in my opinion a bit too much alcohol and not enough fruits not enough structure to balance them so it's it's a really difficult thing to keep those alcohol levels under check and, and certainly the top quality producers are the ones who are who are managing that the best. All right, so going a little bit further down now, we're going down to Languedoc Roussillon. Uh, wish I could spend more time on this area, an, an area that I, uh, you know, have uh, there's some, I've had some absolutely outstanding wines, complete surprises to me. A lot of the the most surprising, wonderful wines that I've tried, um, certainly when I was doing my WCT studies, uh, particularly my diploma, uh, were coming from the Languedoc Roussillon area, which you know is is known for producing uh, IGP paid up and there's some wonderful wines within that for sure um uh there's when you're making igp paid up you have a, i guess a lot more um uh, flexibility on the grape varieties that you're allowed to use so you don't just have to use those grenache syrah or verge you can use some of the other um grape varieties as well that's not the only reason why you might choose to use it to make uh, paid up wines instead of the aoc wines but it could be one of them but generally whatever the the style of, of wine that you're making or whatever however you're labeling it um you're using grape varieties that, that can deal with the climate here. Because again, like with the Southern Rome, it's, it's, wind, it's warm, it's windy. Um, and the yields can be pretty low here, actually. They can be quite low just due to the fact that there's not that much rainfall. And there's not that much rainfall. Uh, there can't be huge amounts of, of, uh, of, of um, grapes being produced necessarily. Um, the AOC red blends, um, the regulations around those almost always, with very few exceptions, include Grenache. And to a greater or lesser extent, Grenache is, is going to be in the blends of, of those wines. Um, in the Languedoc, as a very broad statement, you find that it's, Grenache is, is maybe as important as Syrah. Um, you find Syrah and Morverge and, and Carignan down here as well. Uh, whereas in the in Roussillon, it's it's a more it's a more I guess important grape variety in terms of the proportions of the blends that are here. Um, in Roussillon as well, Vin du Naturel are really really wonderful. Um, I spotted the word Mari in there um, down there, and Vanuels as well, which I mentioned earlier. There's some beautiful um, Vin du Naturel made in all the different styles, so from really fresh and fruity and and strawberry scented through to much more caramelised and, and nutty. Uh, well, reef salt as well, yes, absolutely. Um, so yes, we've got um, a huge variety of different styles of wine being produced at different quality levels, and there are definitely some very ambitious wineries uh, seeking to prove that the long by Roussillon wines can be outstanding. They absolutely can. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Um, I, we just need to we need to see more about them and, and hear a bit more about them as well. Um, Maury, we've got it's another Van Dune. Well, it's it's most famous for producing Bardot Naturel, um, so it's a sweet fortified wine. In, uh, just moving over to Provence to indulge myself, pretending that I'm in Provence. This is where I'm going to stop and just take a little bit of a sip of my of my rosé wine, which is getting a bit warmer than it should have been, to be honest. Um, just to refresh my palate here and to put myself in mind of being in, in Provence. Um, this is um, just a stunning part of the world. Um, it's beautiful. Um, you know, there are very good reasons why there's a lot of tourism here. Um, the Riviera, um, you've got all sorts of different stuff going on in terms of beautiful countryside, beautiful seaside, etc. Um, and the, the climate here lends itself very nicely towards organic uh, grape growing and organic winemaking. 
So there's a lot of organic vineyards here and a very heavy proportion of the AFC wines is, is Rosé. And they're really, really popular wines. Um, they have maintained their popularity for quite some time too. Typically we're talking about the lighter end of the spectrum, dry, um, not really, really dark in terms of its colour, usually on the paler side. Um, and this one certainly is, is dry. It's got refreshing acidity not really super high this is a grenache uh, grenache dominant rosé it's about 65 percent grenache i think and then there's a little bit of syrah and a little bit of samso in there as well um i can show you the bottle i've got here there are many many wonderful producers uh this one's fairly easy to get hold of in the uk which is mirabeau um and uh mirabeau en provence actually made by a uh uh, an English couple in France, uh, but uh, very lovely, um, uh, really, really wonderful wines. I first tried at a food festival uh, in London a few years ago now, and uh, it's it's a good go-to if you want a beautiful style of, of rosé wine from Provence. And there are, you know, there's some really exciting producers here, uh, and there's some very, very expensive producers here as well. There's a lot of rosé wine, um, which commands extreme prices considering that you know if you were to make an art you could make an argument for these being quite, quite simple wines that are fairly easy to make not necessarily going to be using um you're going to be using brand new oak in fact you're not going to be using brand new oak when you're making these wines so they're, they're relatively simple wines they're beautiful lovely and refreshing and definitely are something that i'm very happy to be drinking right now but some of the price points um for some of the very very you know, some, of these, some of these iconic brands can uh, can be just quite interesting as it is there is demand for it there absolutely is and and that's what we've got there so yeah we've got some uh, some famous local celebrity buy-ins that maybe have contributed to the stylishness i suppose of these wines um uh and yes we've got miraval for example which is the jolie pit product indeed um we've got uh, some some famous names behind some of the wines All right, so leaving the south of France, we're going down into, uh, oh, over, over the Pyrenees and into Spain. So as I said, this is a Spanish grape variety, um, really uh, it is, and it's believed to, to originate in the, the Kingdom of Aragon, which uh, kind of extends down from the Pyrenees. Um, and in, on this particular map that you can see here, if you can see where Calatayud and Carignana are there, We've also got Campo de Borja around there as well. Um, this is, you know, this kind of heartland of, of Grenache, uh, the kingdom of Grenache, um, as I think Campo de Borja has as their, uh, as their tagline, um, or the kingdom of Garnacha, I should say, apologies for that. <laughs> um, we've got uh, some really wonderful old vines being produced uh, here, um, uh, wines being produced from those vines too. And all the different types of, of Garnacha are grown here. Um, so, um, we've got, yeah, the Garnacha Tinta, Garnacha Blanca, um, all the different varieties. Um, it is important, it's an important grape variety in a lot of the different parts of, of Spain, um, but nowhere near as much as it once was. A lot of the, uh, the Garnacha vines have been pulled up and replaced with Tempranillo. Tempranillo, um, it, it does tend to be, you know, one of the reasons for replacing with Tempranillo, um, it can produce pretty good yields for a start um, and those yields can still have that kind of maybe a little bit more tan, a bit more acid um, but also uh, when irrigation, irrigation didn't used to be permitted um, and now it is very controlled um, it didn't it became you know it previously Garnacha was very useful because there's not a huge amount of rainfall in Spain so before irrigation was permitted it was very useful to have Garnacha um, which is that drought tolerant grape variety um, and Tempranillo is, is, is less so but with the careful irrigation it's it's uh, becomes less of I suppose a, a priority to, to have Garnacha but a real shame that quite a lot of wonderful vineyards were pulled up um, but there has been a refocusing on Garnacha uh, particularly those very old vines that do still exist um, producing some wonderful wines so we find it um, as part of the blend in Rioja particularly produced um, a, a, as a grape variety produced in the Rioja Oriental the, um, the eastern side closer to the Mediterranean in, in Rioja adding body to the blends again there's some single varietal stuff that's really really wonderful but the majority of, of quite a lot of the traditional styles of of Rioja are using Tempranillo as the, as the main grape variety. 
Um, and uh, in Navarra as well, um, we've found it, uh, you know, I, I mentioned right at the beginning of it, it's quite, Navarra used to be quite well known for its traditional, um, deeper coloured, richer styles of, of uh, rosé, typically dry rosé. And that's, there's still some of those produced. There's also some wonderful red wines they're using Garnacha. But yeah, we've also got some international grape varieties there and, some, and quite a lot of Tempranillo there too. Um, so yeah, the kind of the revival being led by um, some of those older vines, and all these all these places that I'm mentioning now do have a proportion of old vines producing wonderful garnacha. Um, we have um, uh, just one slide that I want to go into in a little bit more detail because I'm going to focus just for a second on Priorat. Um, so we're going to jump over to Priorat, which is in Catalonia, and because this is uh, arguably um, the region in Spain where um, that has maybe done the most for the reputation of Grenache as a, or Garnacha here, as a, um, a really premium quality grape variety with the potential to make outstanding wines that can, can rival anything else elsewhere. Um, so it's a really important grape variety here alongside Carignana um, and the two blended together, which they quite commonly are, produce a wine that is very different from what you might say about you know, most garnacha based wines. You're talking about a very deeply coloured wine with high tannins, high acidity and lots and lots of body. Um, so body, we, you know, we said with our other Grenache based wines as well, but high tannins, high acidity and deeply coloured. That's not necessarily what you're going to find in, in, in some other Garnacha based wines. Um, but here there's a few things contributing to that extra intensity. We've got um, the just the very, very, very low yields that are produced here. So the, the vine's not producing a, an awful lot of grapes at all. So at those lower yields, everything kind of gets dialed up, all the infrastructure and the intensity of the wine gets dialed up as well. Um, and, uh, and also the blending with Carignan. Carignan um, can be a, you know, a, a great one to blend with a great variety like Garnacha because of its, uh, because of its uh, acidity and its color and its tannins that it can add there too. And these are big wines. They are big wines that are intended for the most part to age and they can age amazingly well. Um, they can last for, in some cases, decades before they start to reach a really kind of uh, perfect peak point. Um, it wasn't always the case that, that Priorat was considered to be um, it, it one of the most famous Spanish regions. Uh, for quite a long time it was considered to be a little bit too difficult to get to um, and it was sort of in the, the sort of late 80s the 1990s where the, the reputation started to pick up again um, and it was a, you know a group of producers really focusing on an old vine Garnacha, old vine Carignan um, which they'd come across there essentially and then invested in and uh, while there are other great varieties permitted in, in Priorat as well um, it's, it's those two great varieties that are kind of that are still considered to be the most the most important one of the key features of the of the region is its slate soil. Um, my Spanish pronunciation is not going to be amazing here, but the Icorea uh, soil, uh, which is slate essentially, and it's a kind of you get these rocks that sort of jut out of the ground and they shine in the sun. They have these little quartzite specks um, in the soil as well, which reflect the sunlight um, very nicely and um, and help with the the ripening of these grapes. It's um it's a pretty rugged terrain. It's it, there's a lot you know there's some very very steep slopes uh, that you can find here uh, you can see in the picture here this sort of terracing system that you might find here um, and uh, and yeah that makes it pretty difficult to mechanize um, I mean a lot of the Garnacha vines that I've been talking about are going to be hand harvested just by the, the nature of the bush vine um, that we find them planted in it's not easy to get a, a tractor through there to, to harvest the grapes or tend to the vines um, but yeah particularly with these, the steepness of these slopes here it can be pretty expensive as well and these are expensive wines for the most part um, you can get some wonderful wonderful deals um, but they are considered to be among Spain's most premium most long-lived wines um, and I think, yeah, I, th I, yeah, I think they are kind of really um, driving the, the reputation of Garnacha uh, worldwide, in fact. I think quite a lot of the, the rest of the world takes influence from the best wines of Priora, the best wines of Chateauneuf de Pape and, uh, and, uh, and bases their, their quality focus around that. 
So Grenache Noir um, in uh, Australia. So we're just going to focus uh, just for the last little uh, few minutes before I uh, hopefully won't overrun um, on uh, on Australia. So we're leaving Europe and just dipping into to one particular country. And and for the purposes of this, I'm really guessing I'm focusing on South Australia. So the McLaren Vale and the Barossa Valley in particular, uh, which have again some uh, of these this bounty of old vines. And with, uh, when I say old. You know, we've been talking about old vines before, maybe sort of 50 to 60 years in some cases. Here we're talking about vines that can be 100, 150 years old. Julia, my, uh, my co-host, I can't see just now, um, is uh, um, doing a, a webinar on the 30th of June, uh, specifically on the old vines of, of the Barossa. Um, so I'm sure she'll go into much more detail about how these, how these vines came to be here, uh, be there um, then. Um, but just to kind of go a little bit of an overview of, of, of uh, Grenache in Australia. Um, imported in, in 1832, it's thought to be by, by James Busby, who uh, did a, a, a fantastic tour of, of France and, and Spain and, and took cuttings of some of the, um, the kind of key grape varieties and imported them over to Australia, um, considered to be the father of Australian wine for, for that reason and a few others. Um, and some of the oldest Grenache vines in the world are here. Um, and that is owed in no small part to the fact that South Australia has so far resisted phylloxera. So that louse that, um, uh, that infected the vines all across Europe and other parts of the world as well um, has, not, has not happened here. So that means that a lot of these vines um, didn't have to be pulled up and, and replanted. Um, and they are a lot of them based on their original rootstock. So we've got really, really deep root systems here that go way down into the soil, tiny quantities of wine being produced. The relationship between the age of the vine and the yield is, is hard to, it, it's hard to deny. Uh, typically we've got a um, um, smaller amounts of grapes with smaller bunches being produced from older vines and that fruit tends to be more intense and more complex um, as, a, as a broad rule there too. Um, it was a really, really important grape variety in, in Australia for a long time, particularly when the focus of Australian wine was on fortified wines. So it was a very, uh, a very welcome grape for that. It adapted very well to the Australian climate, loved the heat there, loved the, the Mediterranean style climate that the, the, the McLaren Vale and, and Barossa Valley have um, and adapted well. Um, so it was you know, used liberally in the fortified wines. But when in the 70s, the, the trend started to be away from fortified wines and more towards dry wine production, Grenache his reputation dipped. Um, it was considered to be a bit of a workhorse grape. Uh, it wasn't considered to be one of the ones worth really concentrating your efforts on and, and, uh, and making a big deal about. And the reversal, I suppose, of, of that reputation has only come quite recently. Um, and I think one of the pioneers who deserves a bit of a shout out here would be Charles Melton. Uh, I don't know if anyone's had the pleasure of trying Charles Melton's Nine Popes, um, which is a really wonderful, what they call GSM blend. So GSM being Grenache, Shiraz, Mataro. Mataro is the, the local name for Morbergio, so sometimes it's called Morbergio, sometimes it's Mataro. So that's a blend, it's a Rhone blend essentially, it's what we're talking about in, in uh, a lot of the southern Rhone and uh, in other parts of the Long de Roussillon as well. Um, and, uh, and really putting Grenache at the forefront of that and, and making it a really important part of the blend, not just a kind of little bit to bump out the, the body of the other grape varieties, but making it a really a uh, prominent part of the blend in its own right and it ages just wonderfully I think um, uh, this yeah Nine Popes is a is, is a wine style definitely to try if you want to have a taste of, of um, a Grenache dominated wine um, from from the Barossa um, produced by a, a producer who's really passionate about this grape and he's not you know Charles Martin is not alone in this there are a lot of other great um, producers who are uh, focusing more and more on this grape and actually there's been a little bit of a trend recently towards producing a lighter less heavy less full-bodied style um, of Grenache that's um, a little bit earlier drinking potentially in style as well. So um, some really exciting stuff, I think, still to come in Australia. I think it's gathering momentum. Um, there's been some, some great kind of m marketing. Um, uh, uh, there's been various different kinds of things that have come out of Australia recently that have been kind of putting Grenache back on the, back on the agenda a little bit more, which is exciting. So yeah, I think we're pretty much at the end. I'm just going to do one final slide, uh, if you'll uh, indulge me just a few more moments. I'm just, my, my case, I suppose, for for Grenache or Garnacha. Um, this grape variety that you know is available in so many different styles is something um, for you know there is something here I, I do think for every wine lover. 
There are a range of styles from, from light, dry rosés, like the one I'm drinking here, which is incredibly refreshing and just something that's perfect for a warm day and blends itself, in my opinion, really well to, oh, I'm thinking like Provencal food here with lots of oil and herbs and things like that in it. And then you've got the really big full-bodied red wines um, and you've also got sweet fortified wines that go amazingly well with desserts and cheeses and things like that as well. So we've all price points as well, all occasions. And a, a drought and heat hardy grape variety, which is going to be really important. We need we need those grape varieties um, as we you know have to have to deal with the ever you know ever warming climate. Um, and uh, and when you know Grenache has done well, when it's really kind of concentrated on, it can be a fantastic grape variety. Um, it also offers a bit of a softer structure um, than other grape varieties. We're thinking you know the popularity of Cabernet Sauvignon, um, Syrah. Um, uh, some of those other grape varieties that you find very commonly, they tend to be very tannic and very acidic in youth and maybe need some thyme, need some oak. Uh, this is a grape variety that maybe is um, giving you a more delicate fruit profile, a little bit more approachable in its youth. Um, some of those styles I've talked about definitely need some thyme, but quite a lot of them can be a little bit more approachable when they're younger. And a really broad range of different foods that you can have with this great variety uh, and quite importantly no food at all for quite a lot of them you don't it's not a, a, not necessarily a great variety where you need to have a really salty piece of something to soften it to make it palatable it's lovely on its own all right that's sort of the end of my my case for Grenache um, I think there have been a few questions there but I'll just end on our final slide I'll just you know if you want to learn more about about wine if you want to know more about uh, about Grenache Ganache, um, by all means join us for, for a course I know a lot of you've been coming to these webinars we're so thankful thank you very much you've been a great company uh, during these these difficult times uh, and we'd love to see anyone on a course as well and keep in touch on our, on our social handles etc some nice artwork going on on this uh, <laughs> this last slide here which is lovely cool all right thanks is julia yeah um, we're here. thank hi. you so much lucy that was fantastic um go on have a quick sip of your rosé there you must be thirsty by now it was <laughs> a lot of work you put in there um i'm certainly converted to grenache for now uh, i'm sure many yeah. people will be um, but yeah awesome thank you so much Thank you. Thanks for